Hi everyone. I may not have any fruit juice, but I have a wonderful lecture for you on the brilliant theorist Slavia Žižek. So many of you may know Žižek as the Marxist theorist who in 2019 participated in the Toronto debate, Happiness, Marxism versus Capitalism, with Jordan Peterson. Many others may know him as the subject of various memes, like the audio I just showed you. Um, may know him as a stalwart communist who ironically keeps a poster of Stalin in his apartment. But there's a lot more to Zizek's theories that go beyond his image in popular culture. Much of Zizek's work aims to find a harmony between the works of Marxism and psychoanalysis. But there's much more to his writing that becomes extremely helpful not only in deploying Lacan to a contemporary cultural context, but in understanding how ideology functions. For my presentation, I'm going to be discussing Zizek's idea of fetishistic inversion uh, that he explores in his essay, How Did Marx Invent the Symptom? And how this conceptualization of ideology allows us to view the popular Avenger films in a unique way. This should be fun. So the idea of the symptom is central to Freudian psychoanalysis. The basic definition of a symptom in this context is something that indicates the existence of something else. Freud believes that in the world of the unconscious, symptoms represent unconscious desires and drives. Lacan will later go on to rework this definition into something he calls the synthome, but I sadly will not have time to get into this further here in this presentation. Uh, but does help out with some further Zizek readings if you feel so obligated. Wonderful. So to understand Freud's symptom further, we must look to his understanding first of dream analysis. A dream is composed of manifest content and latent content. These can be described as the form the dream takes and the meaning that it contains. Many readers of Freud believe that this latent content represents an unconscious message, but Zizek shows this is a gross simplification. The latent content is connected to unconscious content, but it is usually conscious to the subject, often pushed aside due to its unfavorable nature, but still accessible to the subject. Um, for example, as some unfavorable things, you know, this can be a fear of abandonment, uh, a sense of guilt or a, uh, for a loved one's passing, or a feeling of sexual inadequacy. Since these issues can't be articulated, oh, since these issues can, these particular ones can, be articulated in language, they do not belong to unconscious processes because of this. However, Freud believed that the latent content of a dream still contains a shortcut to unconscious happenings. This shortcut, which we will see, is what we call symptoms. I'll get to this diagram further, but it kind of helps us understand this as we go along. The very nature of the symptom is that it is non-articulable, as it is unconscious. If we could articulate it, it would belong to language, the symbolic, as Lacan would say, uh, and would be something more resembling the latent content that we see in the dream analysis. Not fun to deal with, but not unconscious either. The role of the psychoanalyst, then, becomes exploring the shortcuts in the latent content that have attached to this symptom and attempting to work through it through talk therapy. The symptom, then, which we see down here in this unconscious kind of dot I have around, is something that must remain unconscious. These are the very conditions of its existence. In this strange way, the symptom is both the abject cause of its existence but also the means for its own negation. This will be explored further, but, but keep that idea of, in mind, you know, that idea of being its own abject existence, but also being its negation. But, but simplifying and going back to my dream analysis example, how does this relate back to the manifest content in our circle here and the latent content of dreams? Well, Freud, Lacan, and Zizek believe that it is the symptom Freud's unconscious desire, and we can see there, that articulates the content of a phenomenon into its form. That without this symptom, the relationship between the content, uh, content, latent content, and the form would cease to exist. 
So we, we can we can simplify this even more from our previous terms of manifest latent and unconscious uh, desires. And here we have it. Um, taking from Marx and Freud, uh, Zizek writes that uh, a form, form must have a content, a meaning. Otherwise, it is would be totally random, chaotic, and not be of interest or importance to us. These are central to both Marxism and psychoanalytic theory. Something beyond the presenting form of the phenomenon we see around us. This meaning to the form we call content. But if we look solely at the content of a phenomenon, we are giving in to fetishism, right? If we believe the content of a phenomenon holds some independent meaning beyond the system from which it emerges, we commit a fallacy and fail to see the true conditions of existence that bring the content into being. We see the tip, but not the iceberg. So this is where we get into somewhat of a, a strange paradox here. You know, as we said, a form cannot exist without a content, but the content is dependent on a larger system. Interesting stuff. This idea becomes clearer when Zizek looks to Marx for the origins of the structure we see here. Um, in Marx, we find these terms of you know, the content, the form, and the system, the larger thing that brings them together, replaced with ideas of commodity, content, value, the form, and real abstraction, uh, which is important to know that use of the term abstraction which is referring to our system. All right, here is my little drawing of how Marx likes to conceptualize it and Zizek. So Zizek uses money as a material example of this structure of phenomenon. Money, which we see right here as the commodity, has no material worth anymore, at least back when it was gold coins, a bit different. Um, its specific content is nothing more than pieces of paper and plastic. But these have a value in their form that allows us to exchange money for something else. However, the relationship between this content and form of money is dependent on an abstraction. And here we see the guy who says, this is worth $5, the prescription of value in the system. For money to function, the very condition of its existence depends on the repression of the knowledge that it is, in fact, worthless. This abstraction then resembles our earlier definition of the symptom. The abstraction of money's worthlessness must be repressed for money to function, to maintain the relationship between the content and the form, the commodity and its value. The abstraction then is the condition of the money's existence. Um, Thus, the system or symptom we mentioned earlier becomes its organizational principles, which is this dude over here. Zizek claims this is how ideology works. Ideology is simply the abstraction we maintain through our repression. These abstractions around the form and content of phenomenon are how we structure and understand the world around us, a thing that would otherwise seem chaotic and random. For ideology to exist, we must give in to the fantasy of its existence. We may think, here's an example, we may think that the police are a bunch of murdering so-and-sos who shouldn't have the level of authority and don't have any say over me, whatever you, you know, go. But we still act like they have this authority. We may know otherwise, but we still act like they do. So this is an important distinction that we find in Zizek's work. Zizek here distinguishes between the process of knowing something and acting on it. We may very well know, as my previous example, that the police are bad or that money is worthless. But as long as we still act in the social world like they are not bad or worthless, the ideology persists and continues to structure our world. Fetishistic inversion, then, is the process by which we repress the ideologies of our social reality. 
rather than seeing money as something that emerges from the system we live in, in our abstraction, we falsely fetishize the commodity of money as having some intrinsic transcendental value that it does not have in its material form. Money only emerges from a system where we as subjects continue to fetishize it. With this realization of the structure of ideology, Zizek reconceptualizes Marx's definition of it. Marx wrote in regards to ideology that the subjects participating in ideology, they do not know it, but they are doing it. Where Zizek writes, through our new understanding of the knowing and the acting and the distinction therein, Zizek writes, they know very well how things really are, but still they are doing it as if they did not. So, as theorists tend to do, uh, Zizek complicates this a bit more, and this kind of ties back to his desire to unify the writing of Marx and the writing of psychoanalysts, specifically Lacan. So, here we go, this new diamond structure. Zizek traces the workings of ideology back to the subject. As we saw it, uh, as we saw, it is the acting of the subject that creates ideology, the doing. So in this diagram, we go from the content and expand it into the form, which is held together in the largest point by the system from which they emerge. But then the system is narrowed to the subject, us, living in it. And the subject naturally is then simplified to the center of the unconscious. Here, Zizek does not see there to be Oh, he does see there to be, my apologies, a center with intrinsic qualities, and that is the kernel of the unconscious. So in the last of my time, I'd like to apply this process of fetishistic inversion to the Avengers films. So looking at the content of the Avengers films at face value, we see a belief in the power of neoliberalism. Individuals working in their own self-interest to have the power to do good uh, by sticking to their own moral principles. A fetishistic inversion fixation on content would say that this is itself the ideology of these films, promoting neoliberal values. But by pursuing the abstraction, the symptom at the center of the subject's understanding of these films, we actually find something kind of darker. So, okay, hypothetical time. You decide to go see a Marvel movie. You want some feel-good, sticking it to the bad guy content. You get your popcorn, you sit in the theater, and the movie begins. You watch the big screen in silence. Maybe even forget you are there. Totally. You're totally engrossed in the movie, as images play across your imagination. At the end of the movie, you leave the theater and go about your day. You're excited and feel satisfied that the good guys will win out in the end. You want the good guys to win, because you see yourself as a good guy. But with the pleasure given from the movie, you don't suddenly decide to, to go punch out your neo-Nazi neighbor. You don't offer an unhoused person on the street to stay with you until they're back on their feet. No, you don't, because in the form of the movie, you just watched... You scratched a desire for change in the world without having to do anything yourself and still came out feeling good. You are satisfied with the knowing, but are left unacting. As Lacan writes, pleasure is gained from approaching the approaching of desire, but the fulfillment of it is always incomplete, never perfect and self-annihilating, as in the Death Drive we discussed in class. The form of the Marvel movies, the Marvel movies take if we look beyond the content, is attempting to fulfill the subject's desire for agency in the world by giving them a shallow glimpse of other individuals who have agency using it, i.e. the superheroes on the screen. We are not superheroes, nor are we in the film. We are just sitting in a movie theater munching on popcorn, separated from the doing entirely. We can never reconcile the separation between us and the other, our desire for agency in the world around us persists, but by going to watch these superhero movies, we are momentarily satisfied through completing a fetishistic inversion ourselves, an inversion that keeps away feelings of inadequacy. 
We push our desire for agency to the content of the films, instead of recognizing this desire as something that emerges from the kernel of our own unconscious. We can look to the content of the films and feel enjoyment from having witnessed the heroes save the world, and believe that we just simply love superhero movies because we... Oh, because we love superhero movies. Um, but what is left out and what we see through this fetishistic inversion is that the enjoyment is predicated on the perpetual inaction and lack of agency the individual possesses in their own life. If we were to recognize that it is us who are lacking, who need to get to action, we would no longer need these films. We would be the heroes, and our desire for the change or agency would be satisfied in our own lives. However, this is not the case, and by continuing to see these movies, we create the very conditions, through the repression of self, of our own inaction and futility. Thank you for listening.